And we're back on Consumer Choice Radio, coming to you on the Big Talker FM and Saga 960. Uh, it is with pleasure that I get to introduce uh, our next guest. Uh, Tony Clement was formerly the member of parliament for Perry Sound, Muskoka. He served as a cabinet minister federally under Stephen Harper and as a cabinet min- minister provincially under Premier Mike Harris and Ernie Eves. He also happens to be the co-chair of a new organization called Reshoring Canada, which is why we have him on the program today. Tony, thank you very much for joining us. It's certainly my pleasure. Thank you. Great. So, I mean, we'll jump right into it in terms of this new organization, Reshoring Canada. Can you explain to our listeners what Reshoring Canada seeks to achieve and, and what its goals are? Sure, and I'd encourage uh, listeners to uh, check us out at uh, reshoringcanada.ca. Uh, but Reshoring Canada is uh, basically an advocacy and information sharing organization. And the idea is that uh, for it's become evident for years, but certainly the pandemic made it even more evident that uh, having supply chains that work properly is important for a number of different aspects of uh, our lives. Number one, security. Number two, uh, it, you know, for jobs and, and opportunity. And, uh, and certainly these kinds of things uh, you know, can work properly, but sometimes they don't. We had a, a personal protective equipment shortage uh, at the start of the pandemic uh, because the supply chain wasn't working for Canada. Uh, and, uh, and so what was the response of government? It was to encourage more domestically produced PPE products. Now we're, we're at the back end of COVID. And of course, uh, Canada was one of those countries that did not have a locally supplied and produced uh, manufactured vaccine. Well, clearly that's an, an issue that is uh, impacting Canadians' health and safety. I look at uh, critical minerals or rare earth elements uh, those uh, particular mining products uh, help us produce fighter jets, but they also help us produce uh, electric vehicles and solar panels. If you want to have a green industry uh, in Canada or the United States for that matter, uh, you got to have the supply chain that matches that aspiration. Right now, that supply chain is controlled by China. So uh, when, you, when you look at it from a security point of view, from a safety point of view, from a jobs point of view, I'm not saying everything has to be produced locally, that that would be absurd, but I think certain aspects of the supply chain have to be looked at again for greater resiliency, and that's what our organization is advocating. And uh, one aspect of this is you're obviously uh, trying to reach out to many corporate leaders across Canada, uh, sort of making the case for them. Uh, But if your audience is, let's say, those who who might be there in uh, the federal parliament, what are the kind of uh, policy steps they could take to help ensure that there would be a a better and stronger uh, domestic supply chain? Uh, Very important question. And let me, uh, let me stress right from the outset that this is a uh, nonpartisan activity. I happen to have been a conservative, but my co-chair Sandra Pupatello was a a liberal cabinet minister, liberal trade minister under premier Dalton McGuinty of Ontario. Uh, So this, this is, definitely ecumenical that way. I want to make that point straight, you know, from the outset. But uh, yeah, we do have two audiences. We have the corporate sector. Absolutely. We are already working with uh, various groups to obtain the information that you're, you're talking about. Like we, we want to have those answers as well. But before you get those answers, we got to ask the questions. So we're right in the midst of uh, doing a, a, a broad survey with and in conjunction with various uh, corporate groupings, the Ontario Mining Association, uh, the oil and gas sector, the manufacturing sector, uh, life sciences. These are all uh, you know, particular industries. Aerospace is another one uh, where we're going to survey the membership uh, of those various sectors, find out what the state of supply chains are right now, and what they think are you know, strengths and weaknesses of that, what, uh, what they would like to see in the future to better secure uh, a, a domestic supply chain. So uh, at that point, we'll be able to share our results not only with the uh, corporate and public sector, 
but with political decision makers as well. So far, we've had really positive reaction. Uh, Vic, Vic Fideli, who's the Ontario Trade Minister, endorsed our initiative. Uh, we've been having discussions with uh, Minister Champagne, uh, who is the Global Affairs Minister in Canada. So th this is a hot topic. Uh, and, uh, and there's no question that uh, as we discovered, as soon as we launched and announced, there was a whole lot of interest. People, corporate sector, the public, uh, politicians are all saying, wow, it's about time somebody was doing this. And so we definitely hit a sweet spot there. And um, since we're also uh, broadcasting in North Carolina, uh, Apple just announced um, or that they're going to have a brand new center there in North Carolina. A lot of people are going to be moving there. There's going to be a huge demand for things like lumber. And we're seeing a huge lumber crisis. Obviously, much of that comes from Canada. Uh, to what extent is the conversation going to take place also with American business leaders and political leaders? And do you see this more as a sort of North American initiative uh, based solely in Canada? What extent will, can, uh, will American partners be involved in this? Uh, they will be. I've already had extensive discussions with a gentleman by the name of Harry Moser, who is the uh, chair of the Reshoring Institute, which is kind of our counterpart in the U.S. of A., uh, and uh, so he's very excited about uh, what we're doing. He's endorsed our, our initiative. We've also had uh, already in the, in the first few days after announcing this, we've had discussions with uh, various representatives of the provinces in the U.S. of A. So, for instance, Catherine Lubier, who is the agent general for Quebec in New York City, is very interested in what we're doing. Uh, Ian Todd and Earl Provo. Uh, who are agents uh, general in um, Washington, D.C. and Chicago, Illinois, respectively, uh, have also contacted us and want to want to be part of what we're doing. So this is not, uh, you know, uh, look, uh, this is not saying, again, let me stress, this is not saying that a proper supply chain is everything is produced in Canada. It, it is saying, let's look at our supply chain. How can we advance uh, our own safety, security, jobs, and that's a very North American, or at least a Canada, Canada, US wide uh, discussion. And, and that's certainly how uh, these various representatives are seeing it as well. And, and so on that note, where is that line? How do we, how do we discern from a reshoring initiative and what I would describe as like traditional protectionist arguments? I mean, I, I fall into the free trader side of things. Um, so this is quite interesting to me, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested to hear your viewpoint on what the difference is between reshoring for, let's say, uh, critical industries and how we prevent that from kind of falling into the camp of being protectionist or restrictionist. Right. And I think a part of the answer is, uh, uh, you know, where you stand depends on where you're sitting. So if you're a government uh, you should be concerned about things that are health and safety related or national security related. And so certainly our discussions on PPE and our discussions on critical minerals or rare earth elements, whatever you want to call it, those fall into that category. In terms of general manufacturing, I think that's less so the case. But uh, we believe that, uh, and we have seen evidence of this, and certainly Harry Moser in the U.S. has seen evidence of this, the, you know, the supply chains that manufacturers are using are being reconsidered. And they're being reconsidered, I think, in a very smart way, a very sophisticated way. It's not like China produces something at a buck an hour. Uh, if we did that in, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, or Mississauga, Ontario, that would, be, that would be 15 bucks an hour. So buck an hour versus 15 bucks, uh, you know, therefore we're in China. Uh, what, what Moser has come up with is a total cost of operation calculation. And that looks at things not just on the price per unit because of labor costs, but looks at the whole supply chain. And when, when corporations look at the whole supply chain and the resiliency of that supply chain and access to that supply chain in times of crisis, there may be another calculation. And I, and I don't think government is involved in that. I think that, quite frankly, that's a a business decision uh, of each business and an industry decision. So that's, uh, that's how I would uh, answer your question. Part of it is business, part of it is national security and safety. Uh, there are different discussions, but they may come up with the same conclusion. 
You're listening to Consumer Choice Radio. We're broadcasting on Saga 960 AM and the Big Talker 1067 FM. We're speaking with the Honorable Tony Clement, a former Canadian Member of Parliament. And uh, you can visit this new initiative, reshoringcanada.ca. Uh, so very central to this, obviously, is um, I, I would say the, the large elephant in the room, and that is of vaccine production and supplies and uh, everything that's happening right now in Canada. Uh, what is your your opinion? Uh, we don't have to get political here, but what is your opinion on uh, sort of how the the vaccine procurement process has worked out in Canada, distribution, and uh, how the the Trudeau government has uh, has really taken care of this? Well, it hasn't worked out very well, has it? I think everybody can come to that conclusion. I think everybody's come to that conclusion except Justin Trudeau. Uh, but uh, the the fact of the matter is, they made a they they didn't have domestic vaccine capacity for COVID-19 vaccine. There is domestic capacity for flu vaccine in Canada. So uh, whenever a government official says, well, we lost our domestic vaccine capacity in the Mulroney years, 30 years ago, it's actually not true. Uh, but we, d- we did not, we were not a center for vaccine production using you know, mRNA technology for this type of uh, vaccine. Uh, so uh, many other countries are in the same spot. Israel was in the same spot. Uh, Israel, uh, you know, Netanyahu uh, of Israel got on the phone to Pfizer right away and, and uh, you know, paid a premium, paid a premium, got, you know, uh, secured access for his entire country. Uh, Canada, unfortunately, uh, decided that their, their vaccine um, production and distribution was going to be co-partnered with China. And then, you know, Two months later, China said, too bad, so sad, you're, you're kicked to the curb, Canada. So that was a big mistake. And so it put us behind a bunch of other countries trying to secure uh, you know, a, a, a product that everybody wanted. And so we're, we're a couple of months behind everybody else, at least a couple of months behind. Uh, and so that's impacting on our third wave and impacting on people getting COVID and so on. So it's, uh, I think the lesson obviously is we need domestic vaccine capacity, uh, not just for flu vaccines, but for other vaccines in Canada. And uh, I, I think uh, most governments have realized that and that there will be a long term or medium term fix to that uh, once this crisis is over. On, on the CanSino deal, uh, I, I love your input here because from an outsider's perspective, I'm just left scratching my head as to why that would be the priority deal from day one, given the geopolitical concerns, the ongoing tensions between our government and theirs. What is there, was there any justification to go that route or, or what was the Trudeau government thinking in terms of partnering with, I mean, a, a government that can only be described as advers- adversarial. Um, so it's not a complete shock that, that they kicked us to the curb, um, which really begs the question of why we went that route to begin with. Well, I, they probably just listened to the Chinese rhetoric, which is very different from Chinese action, right? So the Chinese rhetoric was, we're, we're here in par, as part of the global community. We want to help. Uh, we, we, we're part of the solution. Look at us. We know how to deal with COVID. And the reality is uh, they, they have their own geopolitical agenda, which um, is contrary to Canada's values and interests. So uh, unfortunately, the Trudeau government learned the lesson the hard way and uh, it severely impacted our uh, plans for vaccine. We have about a, a minute here um, before we wrap up. Do you think that this is going to be one of the pressing issues of the next election, or do you think that it will be something that kind of falls to the wayside? I don't think it'll be pressing simply because there's uh, a consensus. Uh, I, th- I think liberals, conservatives, uh, you know, even uh, New Democrats, would say, hey, you know, we for our own health and safety, we've got to we've got to reconsider our supply chains. So the issue is, what do we do about it? And uh, you know, where do we look? And we're we're going to be providing that kind of information and that kind of dialogue in the political process. So we're not hitching our wagon to liberals, conservatives, NDP, whatever, uh, green. Uh, we're saying, hey, we we want to be part of the solution, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Fantastic. Well, well, Tony, thank you very much for joining us on Consumer Choice Radio. Uh, we will certainly have to have you back on the program uh, to talk about how this develops um, and what the progress is 
Um, so yeah, thank you again. And uh, we'll, we'll chat with you soon. For sure. Looking forward to it. Thank you.